from our speakers and also looking forward to to hear from you your questions and where you stand on your path to US market. So thank you once again for joining us and uh, let's start. Thank you. OK, Mike, the floor is yours and uh, the other speakers and uh, also guests, let's say this way you, you can alter and we're going to alter cameras and microphones. You can ask questions either by writing in the chat or you can turn your mic and your camera and please feel free to ask. All right, I guess I'll take over. Thank you, Yelena, and uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, for having me here. I think this is our um, fifth, almost sixth year of, of working together. Uh, I have a presentation here that I'll share. So let me just pull that up here. I hope uh, everyone can see it. Mm, yes, we can see it. It's not in, let me get it in presentation mode here. Sorry, bear with me here. Are you able to see the presentation? Yes. OK, let me try this again here. OK, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, good good morning um, or good afternoon at this point, I believe. Um, my name is Mike Kleisico. I'm the director of the Launchpad USA program. Um, I'm based up in um, Helsinki, Finland. Um, I've been here for about 12 years and today uh, what I would like to do is tell you all about Launchpad USA, um, a little bit about myself. I'll share with you all um, a few tips for a successful entry into the US and I'll try to um, throw in a few examples from companies that I've, I've worked with. Um, I'll share some brief US market updates that I think are relevant uh, to you all as you're looking to either enter for the first time or it might be I know it's you know, already in the process of rent entering the US market. And then as uh, Yelena mentioned, I'm happy to take some questions at the uh, end of my presentation, uh, keeping in mind that this is being recorded. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from the uh, San Francisco Bay Area or the Silicon Valley. Um, I studied at UC Berkeley. While I was studying at Berkeley, I did uh, some internships for some Silicon Valley uh, tech companies uh, back in the late 90s. After graduating from Berkeley, I was commissioned as an officer in the United States Navy. Um, I, I served for a little over six years, uh, both as a pilot and also aboard uh, various ships. Uh, after getting out of the Navy, I um, stayed in Southern California. And I, I went to the world of finance. I worked at Morgan Stanley for close to seven years. Uh, as I was transitioning out of the Navy, I met my wife, who is is Finnish, um, and that is probably the one main reason why I'm now here in Helsinki, where I've been for 12 years. Um, I, I also uh, actively angel invest in U.S. startups, um, early stage seed up to Series A, sometimes into Series B. Uh, so uh, if there's any kind of startup related questions, I'm also happy to uh, heal those as well. About the Launchpad USA program. Uh, this is a program that I, I set up uh, first here uh, for AmCham Finland about uh, nine years ago. And our goal is to support the uh, sustained success of companies that are breaking into or seeking growth in the US market. Um, and how we do that is one, we offer our US market entry specialist basically. We provide advisory services on a tailored or one on one basis to companies that are looking to enter the US market. Uh, my experiences um, from when I moved here, I started talking to at that time only Finnish companies was that, you know, each company kind of had their own timeline, their own uh, goals, and they had different definitions of what it meant for them to enter the US market and only the only kind of supporting uh, programs around them were very structured. And so they weren't flexible really to meet the needs of companies. And so I wanted to offer something that was a little more uh, individualistic to the company's needs. So first we understand what the company's objectives are and when they say they want to go to the US market, what that means for them. Um, and then we can help develop a roadmap uh, for the company to get there. The other part of the program, it is, it program is our targeted networking. Um, these these are to companies and individuals in the US to support your company's needs as you go into the US market. Um, 
you're going to need a lot of support in areas of legal, um, you know, finance, banking, um, human resource management, recruiting, um, you know, the list goes on and on. We have a great network of trusted partners to work with the companies that we uh, that we support, um, that we work with. And so as your as your business um, goes through the process of entering and scaling up in the U.S., we can connect you to our our network to support your your growth in the U.S. market. And then also we have um, the events that um, keep you up to date on what's happening in the U.S. market events like this, um, where we can give provide updates and share lessons learned. I know Yosef has um, a great presentation uh, for you all, given his experiences. So. Those are the uh, kind of the three main components. Again, th this uh, the Launchpad USA program is available to members of, of Amsterdam Croatia. Uh, it's a uh, kind of a partnership, I guess you could say, we've had for about six years now, and it's been been really wonderful. So um, I'm going to transition now and share with you. I think I have four or five um, kind of best practices, um, and th these are things that. Um, you know, I've seen companies do well uh, in entering the U.S. market. I've worked with probably at this point now about 120 or so companies uh, across various industries of different sizes. Uh, to give you an idea, um, currently I'm working with um, an 80 year old Finnish company that um, is quite large in the textile industry. They're entering the U.S. market for the first time. I'm working with a, um, a startup company that's um, making fertilizers from recycled alkaline batteries. Um, they're entering the US market for the first time. And then also working with a few venture backed uh, ICT companies here. Um, I've done projects this year where one of the companies we work with um, is establishing a manufacturing facility in the US. They're gonna employ 50 people. They just been awarded an $80 million um, US, um, basically a contract from the US government. So. I guess the point of me mentioning all this is that, you know, I've worked with a wide range of companies across different industries, different sizes, and again, with different goals for going to the U.S. market. So just keep that in mind with these. Uh, the first thing I always recommend to any company that's looking to um, expand their business into the U.S. is, is take ownership of your business development activities. Um, I, I see companies that overly rely on external consultants or, um, you know, maybe a person they might know who happens to be in the U.S. to be the person who's going to do the heavy lifting of of ident you know establishing your business in the U.S. market, um, and I I don't really often see that yield great results. It might seem easy for you at the start to kind of offload that responsibility to someone else, um, but again, it's not really a credible way to to uh, to start your business in the U.S. Um, and so what I recommend is, is that, you know, that from it's a board level down decision that you dedicate, you know, a key person to from your company, if you're an early stage startup or, you know, high growth company, one of the founders, perhaps to really take the responsibility of developing the US market. I'll talk about kind of the steps to scale your business in the US a little later, so I won't get into that. Um, or if you're a more established company, you know, a, a really senior level person, somebody who has decision making authority um, in, in establishing your business in the US. I put this kind of odd and funny picture here of this dog with this um, little pink skirt on because it's a great story, I think, of, of an entrepreneur that I've worked with here in Finland. It's a 50, I think she's in her mid 50s, um, a lady from the middle of Finland, a very small town, but she designs these these funny little um, heat pants for dogs. And she was determined to get her business into the US market. And she did trips over to New York City and other parts and met, you know, pet shop owners. And and she she had a lot of interest, but she realized that it's a lot of work just to work with even the smallest pet shop, say, in Manhattan. So she decided she was going to go after the big uh, pet retailers, uh, pet or you know, petting good pet goods retailers in the U.S. And so she spent weeks and weeks um, contacting anybody she could at um, PetSmart and Chewy.com, which, if you don't know, Chewy.com is the largest online retailer of pet goods in the world. And 
she actually got their attention. She sent um, a LinkedIn message to um, every employee of Chewy.com, and it was a warehouse manager in Florida who um, saw that you know she had reached out to him and put her in touch with the uh, purchasing manager of our goods. Um, fast forward, their products have been in Chewy.com now for several months. They're now in Walmart stores and Walmart online. They're a tractor supply company. You probably don't know TSC, but it's a very large retailer in the U.S. They have close to a thousand out, uh, you know, retail outlets. Um, they're part of the Shark Tank network now. Um, her business is is booming just because she took the responsibility herself to reach out to the U.S. customers on her own. So, a great story there. Uh, the second thing I always recommend to companies is is really focus your your um, business development activities um, and segment the market. Don't try to, you know, reach out to anybody you can, but really be focused. And the areas of segmentation, we we look at our um, industries, um, maybe even company sizes, um, and then also geographies. You know, the U.S. market is a massive market. It's across. If you just look at mainland uh, USA, three time zones, discounting Hawaii and Alaska. You have 330 million people, roughly, um, very ethnically mixed. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, if you if you really determine what segment of the market you want to tackle first. Um, segmentation will also help you better understand your customers within that particular market more quickly if you're if you can start to create a dialogue with them. You'll also understand what are the kind of competitive uh, forces you're up against. If there's a direct competitor who offers a similar technology, or if you're competing against the status quo, which is often the case if you have kind of a new innovation or a new technology. Um, so segmentation is really important. Again, defining a market based on geography, um, size of companies, and also um, industries um, is important. So. I, I briefly mentioned one of the companies we're working with now, which is a um, really innovative company that makes fertilizers, fertilizers for, for plants and crops to grow. And they make fertilizers from recycled alkaline batteries. And when we when I first started talking to them, they were basically just emailing anybody they could in the US who retails or sells fertilizers to farmers. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the um, ag landscape of the US, um, but it was very scattered and very non-focused. And once we better understood where their kind of their advantages and strengths were and, and understanding where the organic market opportunities were, we've, we've really refined our focus now on, on the West Coast of the U.S. in California, Oregon, Washington, and focus on retailers who have a high focus on sustainability and, and also um, organic um, fertilizers and, and uh, crop supplements, and it's paying dividends. They're sending samples now, and, you know, those are leading to orders. So, you know, just one example of, of segmentation, um, kind of yielding quick results for the company. The uh, third one uh, is, is scale smartly. Um, I've seen oftentimes companies kind of rush to incorporate a, a U.S. company uh, from the very beginning, meaning they register a company in Delaware, for example, and then they go to see if if there are customers there. Um, I, I tell companies, don't be in a rush to set up a U.S. subsidiary if you don't have to. Um, setting up a Delaware Corp can be done literally in about two days. Um, getting the tax ID numbers from the U.S. government and setting up bank accounts, well, that could take a little longer. But my point is that um, there are tools um, and resources to use, uh, like the Visa Waiver Program, which I know Madeline will talk about later, where you can send, again, that kind of key person from your headquarters over to the U.S. to meet customers, um, to actually start to generate business uh, for your product or service uh, in the U.S. before actually establishing a footprint in the U.S., some customers might require you to have a U.S. subsidiary in place. And again, if that's a requirement and you deem that that relationship is worth going through the expense and time of setting up the U.S. subsidiary, then, then you can go ahead and pull the trigger and do that. Um, and again, that can be done relatively quickly. That's something we help a lot of companies do. Um, 
but again, using like the visa waiver program, going to trade shows, going to meet customers and actually starting to to um, develop business in the U US market uh, can be done with a very, very light footprint um, at the very early stages. So again, don't be in a rush to, to hire, hire people um, too prematurely. W one of the recommendations I also have too, and I, I think Joseph will have some comments on it, but um, what I recommend too is, is um, you know, a key person over to the US when you feel like you do want to set up that US subsidiary. I recommend moving a person from your team over to the US to really establish the operations and the culture of your company there. But then very soon after hire a local person um, to to really help with the business development needs of your company. Uh, the fourth thing is uh, location. Um, this again goes a little to the segmentation point I was talking about, um, but also if you're looking to establish a location for your business, a subsidiary where you're going to have employees, uh, you know, really think about um, things like communication back to your HQ, you know, HQ in Zagreb. Um, you know, communication to the East Coast is a lot easier to maintain versus the West Coast. I think you're six hours um, difference from Croatia to the Eastern Standard Time Zone, uh, nine hours to the West Coast, uh, which is significant. We're we're ten hours and seven hours, um, but um, generally speaking, uh, companies like to go to the Eastern Time Zone for easier communication, easier travel. But also think about again where your customer base is going to be. Um, it's not necessarily going to be in a place like Silicon Valley or New York City. It might be. Um, but it might not be. There's a lot of great markets. Um, we're working with companies that are going to places like um, Atlanta, Georgia, North Carolina, um, Chicago area. Uh, there's a few other. Uh, Ohio is is a popular location, especially companies in in uh, manufacturing log logistics. Excuse me, logistics technology. Um, th that's really the hub for for those industries. Um, and then also this comes a big thing to consider too is is cost of living and cost of doing business. There are large disparities in those costs in different markets in the US. Um, so again, something to keep in mind is you're you're hiring people and you're you're moving people over. Uh, and the fifth and last one is, you know, be willing to invest in talent. Again, my recommendation is that you do hire a local person. Uh, fairly soon after moving a key person over. Um, and often there's a sticker shock component to seeing what the salary demands for a good person might be. You know, you have to keep in mind that the US market is probably, I think, the most competitive market in the world, if or at least one of the most competitive markets. It's a fair market. Um, it's a good market to do business in, but it's competitive and to get good people Sometimes you have to invest in talent. The number one complaint I hear from companies that I work with when they go when they begin that process is like, wow, like, you know, we don't know if we can, <laughs> you know, justify paying a person in the US that much money, uh, which is often in the six figures. But the companies who do it, um, I've never heard anyone regret the higher um, the investment they've made. So be willing to invest. Um, something to consider. Um, I know European companies are doing well when hiring local people is that if you want to offer additional incentives, um, things like generous uh, personal time off uh, or more generous vacation policy, more in line with kind of what we're used to in, in uh, Europe, uh, those are things that you as a company can decide to do. And that might attract good people who aren't in it really for as much money, but might be in it for those kind of nicer um, benefits that you could offer. So something to keep in mind there. Sorry, I'm just being cognizant of time. A few updates uh, from the US side. Um, I mean, there's a lot we could, this could be a presentation itself, but I'll just focus a few on um, employment right now. The unemployment figures are really low, so it's a tight labor market. I think the official figures are around 3.6 to 3.8. Um, and labor participation is is historically low. It's at about 61% um, labor participation. What does that mean uh, for companies looking for people? It means that it's hard to find good people uh, right now. 
Um, I do see the very beginnings of layoffs. Um, I'm seeing a lot of startups actually starting to initiate layoffs now um, so they can extend their runways. I think bigger companies are going to follow. And I think that's a positive for your companies if you are, in fact, planning to be hiring over the next 12 to 24 months. I think there's going to be a little looser labor market, which gives you more leverage um, you know, and strength in, in hiring people. So um, that's something to keep an eye on. Um, you've probably seen you know, the Fed's raising interest rates, so borrowing costs for businesses is going up. Capital's less, um, there's more scarce or less available. Um, so, you know, just make sure that, uh, and, and inflation figures are high, like they are pretty much in Europe. Uh, you know, the print right now is over 8%. Uh, I think it's going to stay over 8% for the, for the coming months. Um, and so we're seeing the cost of, of business going up a lot. Um, cost doing business is going up a lot. I mean, it's still, um, you know, consumer demand is good. Business balance sheets are still strong. So if you're in the B2B space, um, businesses are still willing to spend on technologies, especially if you have technologies that can save them on the labor side of business. Um, if you can reduce their labor dependency or, or increase the productivity of their current workforce, those are winning technologies in the market that we're in right now. Um, I think I'll, I'll wrap it up there because I know we have to hear from Madeline and Yosef and um, here's my contact information. Um, I'll put it in the chat if you want, but I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any now. And I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Mike. So if anybody has any questions, you can uh, please jump in. If not, as mentioned, for all those of you who joined uh, later on, we gonna, uh, so you can also add the questions at the very end. We are recording right now, and then when the official part finishes, finishes we're going to stop recording, and hopefully there will be a lot of discussion, a lot of questions. So, Mike, thank you once again. We will be coming back to you uh, when we start okay. discussing. Right now, I would like to invite uh, Madeline from the U.S. Embassy who will uh, share uh, share with us uh, uh, information about different types of visas and what do you need for going on meeting for uh, if you want to stay there and what does the visa waiver program mean for Croatians uh, now. Thank you very much, Madeline. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Yelena, for the introduction. Happy to be here and to, to learn a little bit as well. Uh, so let me get my presentation up. So once again, I'm here from the U.S. Embassy in Zagreb, and I work in consular services. So um, happy to present on uh, non-immigrant visas for temporary work. I know it's a, a topic a lot of people are interested in and have questions on. So I'll go through a, an overview and then take questions at the end. All right, so uh, in terms of where to begin, of course, there's a variety of options that are available for um, employees and businesses if you wish to conduct temporary business in the US or work as a non-immigrant. Um, and we're focusing on, on non-immigrant visas because of course the immigration process uh, is separate. Um, and in this case, if you want to start or run a business in the US, you must first uh, obtain authorization from the USCIS, Citizenship and Immigration Services. The type of visa category depends on a variety of factors. For example, whether your salary is coming from the United States or abroad, or whether uh, you're a company or an employee of a company um, who is seeking a visa, or even if you have a university diploma. Most of these uh, employment-based visa petitions are for a specific type of activity and for a specific employer, which I'll go into a little later, later on. Also, just to note, um, some non-immigrant visas are subject to annual numerical limitations, which means that uh, based on the circumstances, this might affect the amount of time it takes for any individual to obtain authorization to live and work in the US. 
So we always encourage people to uh, consider your options as soon as possible if you're looking to do this. Uh, we also, of course, recommend that you do a lot of research about the appropriate visa category. And I'll share some links and resources later on uh, where you can find more information about this. Um, and it may even be helpful in many cases to consult with uh, an attorney to figure out the, the right class for you. OK, so to start, um, I know everyone is interested in the visa waiver program. So as you know, Croatia has uh, been formally designated as the 40th member of the visa waiver program as of last fall. And this is a program that's administered by the Department of Homeland Security and enables eligible citizens of Croatia to travel to the US for tourism or business for stays of 90 days or less without first obtaining a visa, which is great and it facilitates the process for a lot of folks. So uh, instead of obtaining a visa, the Croatians can now travel on the Electronic System for Travel Authorization or ESTA. And uh, just to clarify, ESTA is not a visa, but it's just an automated system that assists in determining eligibility to travel to the US under the visa waiver program. So um, once uh, people complete the ESTA application, you're then notified of your eligibility to travel to the US. Uh, so th things to keep in mind. ESTA is intended only for business or tourism purposes, and you can only stay for up to 90 days at a time. And there, you cannot extend this period of time. However, you can uh, do multiple trips within the validity of your ESTA, which is usually two years. So even though you can't study or work, you can still uh, do most things that you normally would be allowed to do on a B1, B2 visa which is, for example, attend business meetings, conferences, meet clients, and of course, travel for tourism. And uh, some people may have questions about this, but if you already have a valid B1, B2 tourist visa, you don't need to apply for ESTA. So you are perfectly able to travel on your valid tourist visa throughout the period listed on the visa. And if uh, whenever your visa expires or whenever you know you reach the date, then the next time you wish to travel for tourism or for these uh, business purposes, you can apply on the ESTA website. You enter your travel and documentation information, pay a fee that I believe now is uh, 21 US dollars, and you'll get your uh, approval or the response. Um, the notification usually comes back in about 72 hours. However, this varies, so we recommend that if people are planning travel, you do this as soon as possible. Um, and if in the case that uh, the ESTA comes back as a denial, then you just need to make an appointment at the US Embassy and come in for an interview um, for a B1, B2 tourist visa. And uh, may, may I interrupt? We have a question. Yes. So uh, if I, uh, blah, 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 uh, OK, where where did it go? Herwa, did you remove the question? Because I don't see it anymore. It says, uh, OK, I need I have a project I need to work on site um, uh, in the US for five days, just one time uh, for five days. Can I use ESTA for this without additional work approvals? So it, in this case, it depends on what exactly uh, the, the person will be doing in the US. For example, if, like I mentioned, you can uh, go to visit, uh, you know, consult with clients or uh, meet business partners, as long as you're not being paid by a US source while you're in the while you're in the US. Uh, hello, yeah. It is not about a business meeting. It's a physical work on site in US, but it's paid not by US. It's paid by the European Union country. So from country from Croatia goes to the US and need to work something on site inside the US. So this employee is paid by the creation company, but it's mm -hmm. just several days of work. And is ESTA enough or is not not enough because it's just a few days of work? Right. So. Uh, in this case, the, the ESTA visa is not intended for work in the US. So 
we, that would be, I believe, a, a different type of visa. However, um, if you would like more specific information and I could see the details of, of the type of project that you have, um, and I'll, I can put this in the chat as well, you feel free to email us um, at zagravisas okay, at state.gov. And also visit our website because we have a visa wizard where you can see the type of activity you'll be doing, select, and it kind of prompts you through um, and to see what type of visa you would need. Basically, I mean, I'm from IT sector. What we need to do is unbox the servers and implement in the rec. So it's something physical done in a data center location, which is on US location. So it's a physical work that needs to be done, like unpacking, plugging the cables, and then finishing, but it's mm -hmm. just a one or two or three days work, but it's a work. It's not a meeting. So from the legal perspective, what needs to be done? OK, I will send an email if you don't have an answer now. Thank you so much. Of course, you're welcome. OK, and I just wanted to mention um, quickly again about applying for ESTA because some we've heard from from people in the past that some if you don't get a response within the 72 hours, um, you can actually go back on into the system and check uh, the status of the um, application. So if you're not hearing back, go in again and you'll see if it's pending or approved or denied. OK, and for more information, you can visit the official ESTA website that I've listed here. Uh, it'll give you answers to frequently asked questions and you can start the application process. Sorry, I'll go back there. OK, so I'll jump into uh, some of our most common visa classes for for working in the US. Um, these specific ones do not require a petition, which means you can apply for them directly through the U.S. Embassy. And uh, as I mentioned before, the, on a B-1, B-2 visa, this is uh, the standard visa for business purposes and tourism purposes. And holders of these visas are welcome to travel within the United, the United States in addition to their business obligations. So, um, for example, you can travel on a uh, B1, B2 if you're coming as a business visitor to secure funding, office space, negotiate a contract, attend a business meeting, uh, participate in a conference or seminar. Um, you can interview with a, a future potential employer. Um, however, your while you're in the US on this type of visa, your employment must be abroad and you cannot get a salary from US sources. And uh, in connection with the, the previous question, if you are actually doing work and receiving a salary, you may need a, a B1, which is in, in that case, you do need an interview and, um, and you'd have to see uh, to come in for that. Um, you can also be a member of a board of a US company and use a B1 to attend board meetings. The initial period of stay for this type of visa is generally up to six months per year and extensions are possible for that. There are also cases in which uh, individuals who qualify for H visas, which is another type of work visa, may be more appropriately classified as a B1. So these applicants are working in the US for a short temporary period of time on a specific project or for training, and it's often on short notice. Uh, the salary continues to come from a foreign source, whereas for H visas, the person is being paid by a U.S. source. And applicants for this visa type must have a college diploma. This next group of visas does require an approved petition, which is filed through the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS. Uh, and then this petition is submitted when applying for the actual visa um, and during the interview at the U.S. Embassy. So the employer uh, for these type of petition based visas uh, must file the petition for the applicant and then after approval, the applicants can apply through the interview process at the U.S. Embassy. Uh, the first one is an H-1B visa for a specialty occupation. 
um, you may be eligible for this type of visa if you're planning to work for a US company or for the business that you start in the United States. The um, your occupation normally is one that requires a bachelor's degree or higher in a related field of study, for example, engineers, scientists, mathematicians, IT specialists, and you must have at least a bachelor's degree or equivalent in a field related. The initial period that you can stay in the United States on an H-1B is up to three years with um, possible extensions in three year increments. And the maximum period of stay is generally six years. Also, um, applicants can uh, take their family members with them. So H-4 uh, visas are for dependents and uh, kids can enroll in school, uh, and, but spouses cannot work on this type of visa. An H-2A or H-2B visa is also petition based. And uh, this might be a little less relevant to this group, but it's for temporary or seasonal work in the United States. And again, the US employer files petition on behalf of the employee. And um, again, this is an initial period of stay up to three years, maximum generally six years. L1 visas for intra-company intra -company transferees is a petition-based visa that can be used for a, a specific individual or issued on a blanket basis for a group by large companies. Um, you may be eligible for an L1 visa if you're an executive manager or a worker with specialized knowledge who has worked abroad for a qualifying organization, for example, um, an affiliate, parent, or branch of your foreign employer for at least one year within the three years preceding the filing of this petition. And uh, for this, for the L1, the organization must seek to transfer you to the US to work in one of the capacities that I just mentioned. If you are coming to work in a new office location, for example, for your company, this new office must be active and operating shortly after you arrive in the US as an L1. And the period of stay is again up to three years um, with one year for new office petitions and extensions possible. Generally, the maximum period of stay is seven years for managers and executives and five years for specialized knowledge workers. We also have a special group of visas that may be issued with or without a petition from USCIS. And those are the E visas. So E1 is treaty trader. So your business is still in Croatia, but you have substantial trade with companies in the United States. And for this type of visa, the uh, individual has to have um, Croatian nationality. The activities must constitute trade within the meeting of our specifications. The trade must be substantial. Although don't ask me what the figure is because there's no set number. It's uh, dependent on the type of business and the business plan. Um, the trade is principally, principally between the US and Croatia. And the applicant, if they're an employee, has to be destined to an executive or supervisory position. Uh, also, of course, the applicant must intend to depart to the United States when the E1 status terminates. Um, this type of visa also exists as an immigrant visa, but uh, that's a separate process and has a couple additional requirements and a longer waiting period. Um, it's also recommended uh, for E1 and E2 visas that applicants have a lawyer to prepare their paperwork, which is pretty extensive, and uh, dependents are eligible as well. For an E2, this is a treaty investor visa, and uh, you may be eligible if you invest a substantial amount of money in a new or existing US business. So um, you have to have Croatian nationality and um, nationals of the treaty country, in this case being Croatia, must own at least 50% of the enterprise. The applicant um, needs to have invested or be actively investing in the company and it must be a real and operating commercial enterprise uh, at the time of the application. 
the applicant also must be in a position to develop and direct the enterprise and uh, must have a supervisory position or possess the skills essential to the firm's operation in the US. Uh, like the E1, this visa class also exists as, an as a separate immigrant uh, visa process. Okay, and uh, I know that was not exhaustive. However, we have a great website, the hr.usmc.gov, where you can find more information about visa types. It also has links to USCIS, uh, travel.state.gov, and um, if you would like to uh, apply for a visa directly, so one that does not require a petition, you can go straight to usvisa-info.com to apply there. Also, uh, if you have any other questions, you can feel free to reach out to us at zagrebvisas at state.gov, and uh, we'll be happy to put you in touch with the right people and hopefully answer your question. So thanks again, and, and I'll um, hear from people afterwards, I suppose. Thank you very much, Madeline, for your presentation. Uh, once again, for those who came, in, who came in uh, later, I'm going to be sharing with you all these uh, presentations and slides, so you will you will receive all this information uh, as well. So don't need to write it down uh, or or anything similar. Uh, again, Madeline, thank you very much. I'm sure there will be questions for you uh, once we finish. And now I invite uh, Yossi Vishan from Infinum. Uh, I'm sure uh, you will have a lot of questions uh, for him. He will share experience and the process of setting up the company uh, in the in the US. So. You're still muted, so OK, thank you. Yeah, hello. Um, trying to see. Uh, can you see my screen? I believe you can. Yes, we see your screen and we hear you. OK, perfect. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Elena, thank you for inviting me uh, to participate in this again. Uh, it's been a really nice experience the last time, and I hope that everyone here will have some useful insight from uh, what I'll have to say. Uh, thanks, Mike, for the great presentation that uh, did the introduction into all of this. Uh, I think a lot of things that I'll have to say uh, would have been it would have been useful if uh, we had all of that knowledge uh, back then when we uh, started with our uh, trip to the US. Uh, so first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm the chief client officer at Infinum, one of the uh, partners uh, in the company. And uh, Infinum is a software uh, development company, uh, software design and development company. We've been in business since 2005 and uh, we've been present in the US since 2013. So for the past uh, eight years or something like that. Um, currently, we're doing business in uh, multiple locations. Uh, last year, we've actually opened new offices in London, so in the UK, uh, in Skopje, in, uh, in North Macedonia, and in Podgorica, in the, uh, in, in the Montenegro. And basically, we can say that we have experience with uh, launching business in different states, given that we've already been uh, in Croatia and then in Slovenia, and uh, as well as uh, in, in the US. So uh, given that uh, here I'm talking mostly about the US uh, expansion, uh, first of all, I think the key question is why did we enter the US market? And uh, to add to what Mike said initially, uh, we were already working with some US clients, uh, but uh, what we felt is that uh, we're missing the near client component. So basically, uh, we're always uh, considered some kind of a contractor, some uh, vendor from a third country or something like that. Uh, basically, uh, we weren't considered uh, similar to uh, to any US company. So basically, we wanted to establish our presence within the US and make sure that the clients uh, kind of perceive us as, as equals uh, as uh, some of the bigger US companies that do the same business. Also, uh, there is demand for uh, IT services in Croatia or in Europe as well, but uh, US is kind of a um, the best marketplace for something like that. Uh, it was the first one to kind of uh, 
evolve and uh, to, to have uh, this entrepreneurial environment, which is uh, pretty encouraging. And uh, there's a lot of startups uh, coming up and uh, requiring different IT services and doing the digital transformation. So that was uh, also one of the reasons why it made sense to, to do the expansion of our business in that market. And also we kind of wanted to leave a global f footprint and pretty much all of the big uh, global companies uh, started or have uh, significant subsidiaries in the US. So uh, we felt, OK, that makes sense for us to do as well if we want to be uh, a big global company. Um, so how did we uh, initially do it? So uh, after taking some consideration whether we want to do it or not and uh, how to do that, we figured, OK, uh, given that we're still a small company, um, and we can't really uh, get a foot in the door with uh, some major corporations. Uh, what makes sense is to actually try and target uh, startups and what better place to target startups than Silicon Valley. So what we decided is actually to send our CEO there. Um, and that, to Mike's point, is again, uh, we sent someone who actually uh, was able to make decisions, who was influential in the business, who uh, had the vision of how we want to do business and uh, why. Uh, so he was the best choice of uh, doing that sort of uh, activity. Um, and uh, we didn't apply for any of the uh, visas that uh, Madeline just explained. We actually uh, went for the O1, uh, that's the Extraordinary Alien Visa, where there was a ton of documentation and it was a really lengthy process. But it, similar to what was explained, I think, for the H visa, uh, it allowed for him to stay there for uh, three years and it allowed for uh, his significant other to come with him. So, again, not doing work, but uh, to go with him uh, over there. Um, and yeah, he went there. Uh, he was there for four months in the initial uh, in the initial run, and it was a bunch of meetings, meeting a ton of new people, but not really gaining much traction. So uh, he would go to meetings, and uh, people would say, "Yeah, we'll uh, hear from you. Uh, we'll let you know." And yeah, it didn't really uh, go that well. We didn't get any. Uh, uh, new deals, we didn't get anything signed and we didn't really know, OK, uh, was this really a good idea or not? Uh, but we have already uh, decided to uh, start a company there and we've done all the paperwork and uh, opened the company in Delaware. And uh, we're trying to figure out, OK, so where the money is going to come from? And uh, he came back after those four months um, and it took us actually almost half a year for those contacts he met to start coming back to us. And it's funny what happened when he came back. Uh, he started getting calls from people he met uh, when he only arrived there. Like, hey, uh, we have a project now. Do you want to do some business? And uh, it took a while for all of this to start rolling. And it probably took uh, that whole year for some uh, significant work to come. Uh, but basically, uh, that positive feedback that we saw uh, later when he came back uh, resulted with uh, repeated visits. So he did a couple more of those three to four months uh, visits. But uh, I think the biggest problem was that uh, you're all alone there. Uh, you're meeting new people and uh, there's a lot of challenges uh, along the way. But the one thing that uh, was really useful was referrals either by our existing clients that we knew before we came to the US or through people that we met uh, along the way in in the US. So talking about challenges, um, one of the major challenges that uh, we initially had was cultural differences. So that's the, uh, the example that I had with uh, him meeting people and not hearing back from them or not getting his emails replied or phone calls taken or something like that. Um, that's something that in Croatia we would expect someone for uh, to kind of tell you, hey, I'm not interested. We're not going to do any business in the US. It's a lot different. They'll actually tell you, yeah, your company sounds great. Uh, we'll do some business and then nothing happens. Uh, so that was something that we needed to actually learn and uh, understand the difference, the nuances between uh, how someone said it and uh, what they actually meant uh, in that. The other problem being uh, the networking. So. Uh, for us who grew up in Croatia, we had a network of uh, friends and uh, and people who we know within our business uh, within the Croatia. But uh, the problem was when we entered the US, we didn't know anyone. So we started uh, joining some uh, communities, uh, some um, organizations that uh, would kind of foster networking. But the problem is that you don't really know that many people. And the upside for people within the US is that you're born in one city, you're probably moved to another one. Um, 
you went to college uh, in uh, one part of the country. You met a lot of people from different parts of the country. Then you went back home, you married, you, you moved to another state, and you've basically met a ton of people all across the US. And uh, you have a lot of different uh, contacts that can help you uh, building your network and expanding your business when uh, when, when, when you need uh, someone who can kind of help you boost uh, what's going on. Uh, then talking about uh, problems that we faced when we actually started doing uh, projects uh, was the time difference. As Michael already said, uh, there's like six hours uh, between Croatia and the East Coast, nine between the West Coast. And given that we initially started with the West Coast, it was probably the worst uh, for our CEO who's nine hours uh, behind us. And it was really uh, tiresome to go through meetings the entire day and then you don't even have the time over any overlap with uh, us here to kind of report back uh, to kind of talk to someone just to get stuff out of your head to have someone to uh, j just have a chat uh, for instance and then when you're actually doing business it's even worse because uh, for instance you want to have a meeting with someone in L la and they have to drive to work uh, it takes them I don't know, an hour and a half uh, till they get to work and then uh, in order for you to have some overlap time, they have to wake up at, I don't know, 5 a.m. to get to work at 7 uh, for you to uh, be able to do the meeting late in the afternoon. So it's inconvenience for both sides. With the East Coast, it's a bit better, better but uh, whenever you need some kind of FaceTime and uh, overlap between the two teams, uh, between you and the client, between you and your team uh, abroad, then it becomes uh, a bigger and bigger problem. And uh, there are ways to kind of uh, help around it, but uh, basically it, it is a consistent problem. And then the last of the challenges, uh, I mean, one of the challenges that uh, we also had was the on-site presence. So often clients would like someone to be present. Uh, either it's a designer who uh, would sit with them and help them uh, get through uh, some workshop or something uh, to figure out what they're doing or they would just like someone they can call on the phone uh, when something's off and uh, they want some help or they just want to talk to someone uh, on the phone um, and when you don't have people uh, in the us it becomes a bit more complicated and uh, sometimes you might not get even chosen for a project because uh, they prefer some someone who has uh, the on-site presence um, so those were kind of the major challenges that we had. And then uh, talking about uh, location, uh, so it's inter interesting what uh, Mike said in his presentation. Uh, basically, uh, when we were starting our business in the US, we we're thinking, okay, what's the best place to start? So uh, as I said, we we're targeting startups uh, and uh, place where there's big tech, there's uh, a lot of stuff going on and it's kind of a, a community of uh, uh, tech companies. Uh, so we started in Silicon Valley, but soon we realized that it's not really the healthiest environment for uh, starting up the business because uh, startups uh, start and fail and it's a pretty normal thing. But if you want to have some uh, continual revenue, then uh, recurring revenue, then it's not really <laughs> the best uh, thing for a startup to unload a bunch of money to you and then uh, just uh, fail in the two or three months time because they don't have enough funding or they can't do marketing or something like that. So in time, we decided to move to New York uh, again, uh, one of those uh, more prominent locations. But uh, in this case, uh, it was a place of more enterprise type uh, uh, companies so corporations that uh, are already established businesses that need some extension on their uh, existing portfolios, uh, some additional digital services or something. And uh, then we, we decided that there, that's a better place to uh, to have our headquarters and to kind of uh, expand our business. Um, and that's been a good uh, choice so far. Uh, and we've established an office there, employed a couple of people, but I'll get to that. Uh, one thing that's really interesting and it's interesting in a lot of different terms is the that COVID actually re reduced the importance of the location. A lot of people who used to work in Silicon Valley moved to uh, some uh, smaller towns uh, to their uh, hometowns or something like that and made it le less important to actually be where uh, the business is. Uh, same thing happened with New York, with uh, some other uh, major cities and uh, it became less of a problem for us as well because um, we were able to do the same thing as any American 
besides the time difference, which is obvious, of course. Um, and then moving to the hiring part. So as I said, uh, initially we sent our CEO, so he was uh, basically there and he was the only employee and he was uh, kind of trying to do the business development uh, along with everything else that uh, CEO does. Uh, so it wasn't really that much focused on actually doing some specific work. It was mostly uh, related to business development uh, activities. Uh, but what we realized is that we would eventually need uh, some people over there who will actually do some uh, some other types of work um, and let it let us focus uh, a bit better on uh, what we need to do there. So the way we uh, did hiring uh, for the first time is that we used a scouting agency that uh, basically uh, we gave them a profile of the person that we needed. Uh, it was a business development manager and uh, they came up with a certain set of uh, candidates that we interviewed and then decided on one of them. Um, it was actually a good experience. We uh, managed to find the person we needed uh, and we we're quite happy with uh, the candidate we chose. Um, he's still with us uh, today. And I would say that the biggest problem for us was actually to uh, prepare the the requirements for the scouting agency because uh, in Croatia we already had uh, an HR team and uh, a lot of people who were uh, who knew what kind of profile we were looking for but in this case it was a completely new market and we didn't really know what to look for uh, except that we need someone uh, locally. Uh, later on when we did uh, some similar uh, when we were employing people uh, we also used uh, job uh, search sites so we would place an ad there and people would uh, reply to that ad that's similar to Croatia where when you post uh, a job ad on uh, Moiposo then you result with uh, a ton of applications whether some of them are actually real or not um, and a similar thing happened in the US as well um, but it did land a couple of uh, good candidates and we also managed to uh, hire people uh, through that as well. And of course, lately LinkedIn searches are something that's uh, that's also a good tool uh, to uh, to find uh, people. Um, and then uh, probably more in the challenges uh, part uh, is uh, how do you actually structure the compensation? And uh, it's a great thing what Mike said, uh, trying to mimic uh, as much the perks and benefits that we have here in the in Europe uh, or specifically in Croatia uh, does definitely help uh, provide some kind of a good feeling about uh, your company for potential employees. But also what you need to think about is that in the US, there is a lot of companies like tech companies that uh, started small and that were startups where they offer uh, stocks, stock options and uh, various different types of uh, compensation that are not necessarily just money. And that's also something that uh, if you're opening a company in the US is worth exploring and uh, figuring out how it's going to work, whether that's a good uh, that's a good thing for you. Uh, especially if you're a product company that uh, might uh, at one point do an exit or something like that, then uh, your potential employees will definitely be interested in uh, getting something out of that uh, exit and uh, making sure that they're not just an employee. So that's something that's worth considering. And also, as Mike said, uh, lately the job market has been very tight uh, with the low uh, unemployment rate and uh, it's been really hard to actually find uh, new employees. Uh, one of the reasons is also uh, probably related to COVID as well, because um, with COVID, a lot of different uh, things that were uh, taken by granted uh, now just weren't uh, as as useful uh, anymore, uh, and it it wasn't uh, it was easier for people to kind of go back home and. Um, just not have to work uh, for some company that they don't like the uh, terms and conditions uh, of of the workplace and uh, the company. So uh, people started being a bit more picky and they started uh, asking for more and more in terms of compensations, like uh, even higher salaries or uh, some additional perks and benefits, uh, especially with the US system of uh, how health uh, healthcare is taken care of uh, or uh, how you pay into the 401ks for the pensions and that kind of stuff. Uh, it becomes really important to uh, 
correctly define the compensation package so it could be attractive to your uh, future employees and that you would actually be able to uh, to get them uh, to sign for your company. Um, so looking at all of this, um, I would say that uh, some of the advices I would have to, on how to start uh, when going to the US. First of all, do a thorough market analysis. That's something that uh, Michael already mentioned, but uh, basically without that, uh, you'll be out on your own. Uh, you'll be uh, just trying to figure stuff out when you're already there and it's not going to be good. You're going to waste a lot of time uh, and it would make a lot more sense to kind of know what you're doing and where you are. One of the things that you need to figure out also is to determine uh, key employee roles you need uh, if you're hiring uh, in the US. So basically you want to figure out whether you just need a managing director that'll take care of everything and coordinate stuff, or you need some people that will be close to the client and what kind of roles those are. Uh, do you need some uh, high skilled professionals that will do uh, strategy or um, designers or uh, some kind of a tech lead that will uh, take care of um, all the incoming requests and uh, do meetings with clients. So basically you need to de determine what uh, roles are uh, the most important and make sure to hire those roles uh, within the company. And also, uh, when you're hiring, uh, it's a good thing to hire local people because they offer a unique uh, overview of uh, how the market is uh, going on. They probably have experience from uh, their previous uh, jobs. Uh, they might already have a, a big business network. They might have connections. They might have ideas on how to improve your uh, business plan. And it's definitely a much better thing to do than just to uh, start fresh and uh, basically reinvent the wheel uh, instead of uh, having someone uh, as a support. We've had both of these situations where uh, we both had uh, someone who didn't really have enough uh, uh, knowledge and uh, information, so it took us a long time until we actually uh, managed to uh, get the business started. And then last year when we hired uh, a managing director in the uh, in the UK, we actually had a much better start because uh, he was already doing a similar type of business as uh, we're doing now and he was able to uh, quick start the company uh, a lot easier than we would have done on our own, not, not really knowing the market as well. And also something that's uh, a lot of times uh, overlooked is uh, offer support for people who are uh, in your uh, office abroad because you might have like just one person or you might have only two people there and they'll feel left out of pretty much everything that's going on in the company even if you have some face time with them um, they need support they need to feel that they're part of the company they need to be integrated within the company either they come here for some onboarding or uh, you send someone over uh, from time to time uh, or at some frequency to make sure that they're feeling uh, a part of the company that really helps because otherwise they're just sitting in their office in their cubicle whatever they have uh, in the us and then they're feeling lonely and you need them to feel a part of your company and also something that uh, came as an idea to us instead of necessarily opening a new company uh, in the US or anywhere else uh, perhaps there is a similar company that you could partner with uh, that you can help them extend their services or you can complement each other's services uh, because that that's someone who already has a foothold uh, in there and uh, knows the market and can probably find a, a good uh, a good business uh, business case for both of you to prosper from uh, that relationship. And that'll be it for me for now. Uh, thank you for uh, for listening and for any questions. Yeah, feel free to uh, feel free to ask. We already have plenty of questions for you, Josip, in the chat, so I'm going to read them uh, one by one. So first one was, how long did it take for you to land a larger corporate client, agree on the terms, sign a contract? Uh, so is the question how long did the negotiations take or how long did it take for us to actually uh, get uh, to so, yeah, a corporate exactly. client? Yeah. Just how how did how long did it take for you to land a larger corporate client? So everything to get to know okay. them, to sign a contract, to agree on the details. 
Uh, that's a good question. Um, trying to remember what was our first larger corporate client. It probably took a f took a few years until we got to land a larger corporate client uh, because we we're pretty much taking it slowly and starting with uh, some startups and some um, smaller companies. Uh, so it probably took a couple of years, but it really depends on how you put your focus and how do you market yourself because then you can uh, basically you can target them. You can get you can prepare a list of the different companies that you want to. Uh, that are potential uh, clients of yours and then uh, present uh, something towards them, try to contact someone uh, within their organization. Uh, for example, what Mike said about uh, sending a, a LinkedIn message to uh, all the key people, uh, something like that, then it helps you uh, speed up this kind of process uh, without waiting for you to become known enough and to expand your business network enough to actually be able to, to, do, uh, to, do, to for them to find you. Uh, what do you think was the most important for them in the process? Um, I think uh, what was usually most important for us was uh, the confidence that they had in uh, the services that we would offer. So we kind of uh, had this uh, aura of uh, doing quality work and doing something that uh, they'll actually uh, so I would say like this, um, usually you have some, some someone uh, like uh, some kind of a manager or someone who needs to get some results done. And uh, what they need actually is to make sure that they've accomplished their goals. And if you present that you can help them accomplish those goals well, uh, then that's something that's really important for them. So the I would say the presentation skills uh, and uh, being able to showcase that uh, you'll do good work is probably the most important part. Uh, at this time, did they consider you a Croatian or American company? Uh, so uh, lately, we've been considered pretty much uniquely the US company, uh, given that uh, that's the way we present ourselves and that, uh, how, how we approach even the clients. We don't even discuss having a Croatian uh, uh, headquarters. Um, and it comes up in the conversation that uh, we're a large company that's a multinational company that has six subsidiaries, but uh, we approach them as the US company when it comes to US clients. Uh, initially, when we were doing business, uh, they would usually take us as a Croatian company, especially because uh, in the beginning, it was all Croatian names uh, that were coming up on those calls. Uh, it was Croatian people. We were we had the time difference of six hours to even join a call or something like that. So it was pretty obvious that it was a Croatian company running behind the, the US cover. But now that we actually have people there, uh, they just yeah understand uh, that we are a US company with uh, other subsidiaries around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you do the market analysis and market segmentation? Are there any online tools tools for that? Any recommendations? And did you hire a US company uh, or did did you do this on your own? Um, so I think this really depends on uh, what you're actually doing. And uh, I'm pretty sure there are companies and tools that could be used. We did most of the work on our own uh, because we, we had a business development department that uh, knew what were our targets and uh, what kind of uh, what kind of um, potential clients are we looking for. So we did some research. We uh, did a list of uh, potential clients. Then we tried to look up uh, who, who's the key responsible person uh, in those companies and then uh, kind of uh, decide uh, which companies to target and uh, yeah Mike I think you have yeah, something is, to add. is it okay if I jump in on that yeah yeah go um, ahead, of, course. of course yeah I should have mentioned this one of the ways we also approach it with companies is that we start by looking at which um, you know segments of the market their product or service might deliver the most value to currently um, you know we work with you know, software companies that are in the B2B space, but they work across different industries. And and if we can find, you know, um, kind of success cases or, or um, things that really stand out in a particular industry, then we will often use that kind of as a, as a gateway into the U.S. market. And, um, you know, U.S. customers um, generally are kind of very value focused. It's, you know, how are you going to save them time or money um, is, is important. So, 
if you can show that you've already delivered delivered to them in those two areas somewhere else, um, that's usually a good place to um, to focus your efforts on. Um, you know, to references, I think we discussed this before, Yosef. I mean, using a Croatian reference company or you know, you know, a small unknown Finnish company or European company might not mean anything. But if you're working with large European brands, um, I think those translate very well. Um, you know, it'll help you establish credibility and trust in the market. Uh, you can be kind of fancy if you're working with, you know, maybe lesser known uh, companies, or if you're working with, um, you know, governments or municipalities, you can mention kind of generically or describe who your customers are without using specific names. Thank you very much, Mike, for for adding. So uh, right now we have one question for uh, for Madeline, so for Embassy. Thank you very much, Josip. I'm sure we will uh, we will come back to you with additional questions. But right now there is a question for uh, for Madeline, and something we at MCM get asked a lot this question, and we would also like to know. So um, her is asking is uh, it's great info and success, of course, for creation U.S. Uh, visa SESTA program. However, is there any progress about agreement between um, the U.S. and Croatia about avoiding double taxation like many other EU countries like Germany have uh, have agreement in place? And of course, this reflects on business decisions and it's on top that this agreement is in progress for years. But is there any real progress or estimation when it will be up and running? Yeah, I, I know this is a, a topic that's frustrating for a lot of people, uh, the double taxation issue, and we get questions about it a lot. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any specific updates about this. However, our previous ambassador, Ambassador Korhorst, did set things in motion to try to resolve this issue. Um, however, the the U.S. Treasury is uh, slow at, at implementing some of these things. So no um, updates for that, unfortunately, in terms of timeline. However, just know that it, it's on our radars and, and it is in motion. Hey, thank you very much, Madeline. We have no more questions through chat right now. So this is a sign for me to stop recording. So 